Well, would you like to turn with me to Luke's Gospel and chapter 12? Luke's Gospel and chapter 12. Can we be thinking about particularly the words of uh, Jesus as in uh, verse 13 down to verse 21? What's otherwise known as a parable of the rich fool. Now we're about to spend some time thinking about the ministry, the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we need to remind ourselves that there are two mistakes that people make about Jesus Christ. One is a mistake that the non-Christian makes. And one is something the Christian often forgets. And the mistake is this. The mistake is to try, is to somehow think that if we know something about Jesus Christ, what we know is sufficient and we can put him in a box and just put him on a shelf because we got him worked out. I want to suggest you this morning one way in which Jesus Christ is so radically different is this, that Jesus Christ can be described in many ways as a reactionary. A reactionary, one who always did the opposite to what generally we expect and what this world expects. In many ways, Jesus summed it up in his own words when he once said to a man who asked him uh, about his authority, look, my kingdom is not of this world. And throughout Jesus' life and ministry, there is this constant reaction that he has to what we think is life, what life is all about, what this world is all about. And Jesus is saying, actually, you know what? It is something absolutely radically different. And that comes out here in this passage. Now, what is interesting is the context in which this parable, the parable of the rich fool, comes about. If you we read the passage together, and here is Jesus, and he's teaching and he mentions some of the biggest issues that his message is all about. He talks about the reality of the God who we have a relationship Whether we are Christian or not, we have a relationship with this God who has made us and watches over us. But he's talking about this great God. He's talking about the reality of the life that he offers. He's talking about the empowering Holy Spirit who's at work in the world. He's talking about the great things of the kingdom that he preaches about. And suddenly in the midst of all that, this guy in the crowd says the most strange of sing, doesn't he? We read it there in verse 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It's a, you, you, if you read the passage carefully and what Jesus is actually teaching, you think, where on earth does this question come from? Is it simply the fact that this guy's thinking, well, this guy's, this guy's got, he's got now, he's thinking, he's, this guy's a clever teacher. Let me ask him, it could be that. But you notice what Jesus does. As a reactionary, he immediately focuses on the tr tragic mistake that this man holds on to about life. And what he does, he then begins to teach this on this whole matter, what, what we would describe, I, I, I trust, uh, as contemporary uh, people listening, we would describe as materialism. And when I use that word, I'm talking about the world in which we live, that it is a, it is a physical world, it's a material world, and so much of our life, if not all of our life, is built upon what we can see, what we can feel, what we can taste, what we want, what we can get, what we experience. The material world in which we live, and Jesus suddenly turns that all upside down as he tells his, turns his, tells his parable. Now... Um, I looked this up, so not that I'm a Madonna fan, but uh, if she's, oh, she's still going, is she anyway? But Madonna, there's a line in one of her songs, isn't it, Material Girl, which says, because the boy with the cold cash is always Mr. Right. Um, it, it's that sort of attitude, isn't it, that, that comes out in life so often. That what matters is that I've got the finances to do what I want. What's the big issue at the moment? We're concerned, rightly so, because there's a pressure on our finances, a pressure on the material life in which we live. And those things Jesus is not, not concerned about. He is. 
But what he's doing here in this parable is saying, look, do you know what? There's something more here. As someone put it like this, Jesus came to bring people to God, not bring property to people. One of the great tragedies of the history of the Christian church is that so often it's forgot that. So often it's forgotten the great call of the apostles in the early days of the church at Jerusalem when they said to that man who was uh, an invalid, we don't have silver and gold, but what we have to offer in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So Jesus in this parable of this rich fool is dealing with the whole issue of how do we think, how do we respond to the whole matter of materialism. Whether we're Christian, whether we're Christian this morning or whether we're not, what does Jesus do? What does he highlight? Now please note before we look at it, Jesus says in verse 15, take care, before he tells the parable, and be on your guard against covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Notice, very important there, he's not saying possessions aren't important. He's not saying possessions aren't part of our life. They are. It's this abundance. This idea that all that matters, the most important thing in life, is what we possess or what we aspire to possess. So what does Jesus do? Well, notice first of all, as the parable unfolds, he does this. First of all, Jesus challenges the fickle an unpredictable nature of simply living for material possessions. Now, if you look carefully at verse 15, it says this, doesn't it? And he said to them, take care. Uh, if you've got a different version, you might say, take heed. The root of the word that's actually used there literally means to stare. To stare. To stare long and hard. Like I got you to try and look at this dolly this morning. To look at it. To stare. And Jesus is saying, let's take a long, hard look at the material world and the, the tragedy of just thinking only about that. Notice how he brings it out. First of all, it's this. he says, well, there's this guy, he's, 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 he's a farmer, he's, he's, got, a, he's got a field, he's, he's got crops, and suddenly he has this abundance of crops. But as Jesus tells a parable, the question he's asking is this, well, why did the man's crops increase? Now, we're not actually told. Was it because he suddenly used a new fertilizer? Was it simply because he, you know, he got more fields? What was it? Well, we're not clear. Jesus' point surely is this. Can I put it like this? For all of us, in terms from where we stand, life is a little bit like roulette. We throw the, the ball spins and it lands where we don't know. Jesus' point is that suddenly this man's life changed in a way that he couldn't imagine. He didn't actually win the lottery, but suddenly there was this vast increase. He had more possessions than he ever expected. And it's fascinating that actually the Bible throughout its message is constantly kind of saying to us, Do you know what, life as we live in the world can sometimes be times of abundance and fall of the material blessings of this this, this world which God has given and good and sometimes it can't even in the writer of Ecclesiastes he, he puts it this way he says in the morning sow your seed in the evening don't withhold your hand you do not know what will prosper this or that or both isn't that true of life we put all our eggs in one basket perhaps about something that we desire and suddenly it doesn't work and we're down and suddenly out of nowhere something just comes along that's not kind of, that's not God being fickle. That's the reality of life in this world. And what Jesus' point is, is look, don't you understand, he says, that the, 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 the truth about living for the material possessions, you cannot, you cannot understand just how fickle they are. They're here one minute and they're gone the next. All that we have, of course, comes from the hand of a good God. God gives. 
Sometimes God doesn't give. Sometimes it's taken away. Jesus' point is simply to get us to think about how fickle living for the material world is. And he brings out in a couple of ways, doesn't he? He says, if you like, first of all, well, how certain of you about living life for material possessions? It, it, look at the contrast here. Here's this man. He's suddenly got this increase of crops and he starts talking to himself. What shall I do, he says. I know what I'll do. I'll tear down barns. I'll build bigger ones, he says. And I'll have many years to enjoy what I've got. And then comes a contrast. This night. You see Jesus' point, the contrast. How we think. Many years, and Jesus said, well, hang a minute, actually, no. This night, something's going to change radically. How fickle they are. Are you convinced about the certainty of living for material possessions? I'd be amazed if anybody's heard of, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, Gutson Borglum. Anybody heard of him? No, good. <laughs> he probably was responsible for one of the iconic pieces of this world in which we live. Anybody who, who, who's uh, seen Mount Rushmore and the president's faces there, those, that, those huge kind of, you know, the American founding fathers, different presidents, he's a guy who started it all. He's a guy who actually started carving that huge, that huge, huge monument to these, the face of these men. Tragedy was, he never saw the end of it. He, 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 was, he passed away in uh, 1941. The thing wasn't finished for another 15, 20 years. Are you convinced, Jesus is saying, about the certainty of living for material things when they're so fickle? Are you convinced that your life is to do with as you please? Here's this guy, he says, don't you know what? I've got some barns, I don't know what to do. I'll, I'll just pull them down and build bigger. And again, Jesus is not attacking, thinking, planning, building with our lives. What he's saying is being presumptuous that that is always going to be ours to do. And what he's saying is the tragedy about living for the material world alone is, is this. It's the fallacy of thinking that our lives are ours to control. Because the one thing that comes out about this man here is that right from the beginning that Jesus introduces him, he thinks, my life is mine to control. More crops, I can do what I like. I can knock down barns, I can build barns. I can look forward to a future. It's all in my hands. And of course... We are responsible. But all the while, of course, what's the, what's the tragedy as he focuses on the material possessions? Jesus brings out later, doesn't he? The tragedy is he forgot that he lived in a world but that was made by a God who created him and was over all that he did. Jesus is saying the tragedy of this man was this one thing, wasn't it? That in spite of all the advantages of this, all this dwelling upon the material possessions, the good things of life, he forgot this one thing, who he actually was. Made in God's image. Made for a relationship with God. Made to know this God. And he didn't actually take time. But notice, secondly, Jesus analyzes the detrimental effects of simply living for this world, the material world. It's the great Louis Armstrong, isn't it? The uh, great uh, jazz uh, trumpeter who sang that song, We've Got All the Time in the World. Yeah. And, uh, one of James Bond's films, I think. In fact, Jesus is saying here, isn't he? Do you know what, friend? You're asking about dividing the inheritance, your brother's inheritance. There's a bigger question here. How much time have you got? The most precious commodity you possess 
is the time that actually you have. Notice how this man's obsession with the material it affected him. Jesus says, first of all, it affected how he thought, his rational faculties. He thought within himself, Jesus says. He thought within himself. And of course, the, the point that Jesus is making, with all the, his thought, there was a degree in which it was illogical because he neglected to think about the most important matters, who this God was, who made him and gave him life. That's why perhaps the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, a young pastor struggling uh, with some of these issues and, and living life and being a servant of Jesus Christ, he says to him, doesn't he, in 1 Timothy 6 and 7, look, he says, Timothy, we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out, if we have food and clothing, let us be content. Isn't some of the um, reasons why we Christians sometimes struggle, like the non-Christian, is because sometimes we forget that in Jesus Christ, no, 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 we called, but we have all that we need to be content. How rigid his thinking became, this man. What, what, what consumed him? I've got to deal with this surplus of product. I've got to knock down barns. I've got to, I've got to build more barns. I've got to make preparation for this life and it, my existence here. Absolutely, that's all he seemed to be able to think about. Now presumptuous again, thinking actually, well, do you know what? That's, that's all I can see. That's all, I, that's all my vision extension. That's what really matters. And notice what an effect it had upon him as a human being. Do you notice how many times he said to himself, I, me, I will say, my crops, my barns. Do you see what Jesus is hinting at? Notice how there's a sense in which he lost his humanity. It was all about self and not about those around him. And Jesus' point surely is that, that, that that's the tragedy that he portrays in this man of just pursuing his material well-being. I think the truth is that Jesus is saying, if I can put it like this, the problem is of all of us, whether we're Christians or not, that the spirit of Scrooge is very much alive. It's all about us and what we can get. Is that why James, when he writes to those group of Christians in chapter 4, says this, look, he says, where do all these quarrels and arguments come from? Where do wars come from? Isn't it because you desire this? You want this thing above everything else? It's something that's worth thinking about, isn't it? I suppose it comes to this question. Can we say we hold possessions or do possessions hold us? And then you come to the can I put it that way without being derogatory? The sucker punch, don't you? Then you come to the impact of the, of the whole parable. Jesus has gone through, described this man, what's happened to him, why he's thinking. And then he says, doesn't he, in um, verse 20, but God said to him, fool. When I was growing up in South London, that used to be the ultimate insult. Actually, I grew up in a large West Indian community, and if you wanted to, to kind of really put someone down, you say, you fool, man, you fool. Almost like B.A. even before B.A. Baracus of the A team, it was kind of it was in in the sixties and seventies, believe you me. But here is something much more somber than that, isn't it? Here is Jesus saying, here is God's evaluation of the life that this man chose to live in the pursuit of the material world to the exclusion of the good God who gave him all things. You fall. Why? Is that because God of the Bible, the God of the Bible somewhere is just some uh, being up there that to, 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 with total indifference looks upon us and mocks? No, 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 no. 
Jesus uses this word for a number of reasons, doesn't he? He uses this word because, first and foremost, this man ignored the witness of his own heart. And what was the witness of his heart, the witness of my heart and your heart? Well, the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us, doesn't he? He says, God has placed eternity in our hearts. We instinctively know, don't we, that we are made for something more just than this life and the things of this life. That is why we know, don't we, that whatever we possess, in the end, ultimately, we, we end up unsatisfied. Because something more is needed. Something more. It's God himself. And of course, the tragedy of this poor man is that he, he actually forgot that. He, 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 there was this constant struggle going on. I need this, 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 and this. And actually... You know what? No, there's that instinct of which we are created. God has placed something in our hearts that says we need actually more than this world can ever offer. He was a fool, of course, too, because he ignored his greatest possession anyway, didn't he? You notice the emphasis? Your soul. Now, however we think about the soul... The Bible says it's, it's our inner faculties, our mind, our emotions, our will. It's the real us. You see, Jesus is not condemning this man's energy or in that respect. He's not even condemning his wealth per se. What he is condemning or pointing out how foolish it was is a lack of his foresight that the most valuable possession he had was this eternal soul that was made to know God and to enjoy God and to be forever with God and this man all he could think about was the here and the now and what he could see in front of him he neglected the God who spoke so clearly and said let not the rich man glory in his riches nor the mighty man in his power nor the wise man in his wisdom. Let the person glory in this, that they know and understand me and who I am. There's a reason, isn't it, why Jesus told a very powerful parable that contrasted two people in the material world. He spoke about a rich man, Lazarus, who did not lack for a single thing. And he spoke about a poor man, Sorry, a rich man should say sorry. And he spoke about a poor man called Lazarus who was absolutely poverty stricken. And they're two different ends. And, and Jesus is pointing out, isn't he, this, this, this incredible thing that a, a, a Christian is someone who can actually live in the world and possess absolutely nothing materially but have all things. And I could be Elon Musk this morning. if I don't know Jesus Christ and the God whose love sent him nothing can make up for that can't it that's, that's just got an important point isn't it come on you, you're here this morning I don't know what, how you come you've got all sorts of struggles I'm going on as a family I'm sure and there's all sorts of difficulties you're facing some of those may even be financial uh, understandable so but surely God is <laughs> we, we've got a saviour here he's saying here I am I'm not saying I'm going to make life a bed of roses. What I am saying is that I am always sufficient to meet your needs. I am always here to be the God whose love will empower you to live throughout all your days. And this poor guy, I just totally missed the point. But tragically too, if I can put it this way, He'd forgotten the one, the one thing about life in a material world that shows you how it's never enough. Jesus says to him, you fool what? This night your soul will be required of you. What's he saying? This night you're going to pass away. Someone said this, death is the final mockery of, ma of a materialist life. Because you brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out. 
my my eldest son um, my eldest son lives, lives is married and lives in America, um, uh, the land of the free, uh, and uh, there, there is. It's not as popular, but there was this thing a number of years back on the back of American cars, this big, these, these car stickers. Uh, it said this, the one who dies of the most toys wins. Now, some people think that's iconic. I would suggest to you that our Lord Jesus, as a reaction, says, actually, do you know what? That is ironic. When the great God offers himself through his son to think that we can enjoy life simply by the material things is to miss the point. That leads me to, to, to one final thing. You notice that Jesus, he always does, and, and it, you know, <laughs> there's a degree in which, well actually this is, this is the degree of ne negative teaching. Sometimes it's needed, isn't it? You have to pull down before you can put up. Notice the way Jesus always brings in the positive. Look how he sums up the end of the parable. He says, so is he, or so is the one, should I say, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And the question you want to ask yourself is this, doesn't it, really? How does one become rich towards God in a material world do I give all that I've got away well no that's a kind of a perverted monasticism isn't it do you know what the answer is how do I become rich towards God I can't I can't become rich towards God but what I can by the grace of God is receive God's riches in his son Jesus Christ it's fascinating isn't it when Paul begins to write to the church at Ephesus he does so by, by laying down for them if you like in those first 14 verses of chapter 1 he lays down the spiritual riches that are theirs there's a, there's a wonderful way in which he just, he just, he just kind of draws the, the, the panorama that belongs to the Christian. And he begins that by saying this, Thanks be to God who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. And later on, when he writes to the church at, uh, at Corinth, doesn't he? He, he's, he's, he says this to them, he says, you know what? Just remember that it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, for our sakes became poor, that we might become rich. In other words, the great truth that's coming out here is, is, is this, isn't it? That the Christian is someone who possesses in Jesus Christ all things that they need for life and happiness and joy. And no matter what the outward circumstances may be, the material circumstances, they may change. But Jesus Christ doesn't. And of course, if you're listening this morning and you're not a Christian, you say, well, okay, this is, why should I listen to this? Why should I listen to this reasoning? What's the point? Well, here's a, here it is, isn't it? Here it is. Jesus lived a life in a world like this. He lived a life in the material world. He knows the score. He lived a life brought up in virtual poverty, didn't he? Subsistence living. He knows the struggles that actually go with living in a material world like this. But he knew too that there are two perspectives in life. As I began by saying, there is this world and there is this world to come. And he spoke with such wisdom on these issues because of who he is. And the proof of the pudding is this, that Jesus Christ was willing to give his life, to lay down his life to make people like you and I rich. Wow. Hold on, you say? You bring me back to the cross? Yes, I am. 
I'm bringing back to the cross where the eternal Son of God chose willingly to lay down his life to deliver sinners like you and I from a world like this that would, like opticus tentacles, would keep hold of us and pull us down. And he gave his life on a cross and was buried in a grave and rose again to give eternal life. And don't forget, eternal life is never simply about duration. It's about quality. It's about knowing the reality of God's love and grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close with this story. A number of years ago, um, I, I, I was privileged to go out to uh, the States for a, a conference. Um, and uh, the conference was held in Chicago. Um, and it was held in a Christian college. Some of you, I'm sure, um, heard of it, called Wheaton College. Uh, and one of the ex-students at Wheaton College um, gave his life as a 26-year-old in an Amazon jungle with a number of other men. Jim Elliot. And in Wheaton College, there's a mural and it's got up this picture of these guys and their ministry and their lives. And it's got this famous saying of Jim Elliot's. Forgive me if you know it. But he said this about being a Christian. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. If you're a Christian here this morning, whatever you've given up, it wasn't yours to keep anyway. But he who you have gained, you can never lose. And if you're not a Christian this morning, that, that, that's, isn't that something you to ponder? What can you hold on to? What can you hold so dear and build your life around that you can hold on to? Ah, but Jesus says, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, and I will give you all that you need for this life and for the life to come. Are you, what are you this morning, I wonder? Are you someone who can be classified as a fool by being blinded by the light of the material world in which you live or you someone can say by the grace of God Jesus Christ is my all and in all